prophet Jeremiah's uh, ministry uh, was from the very get-go prophesied to be extremely difficult. And so if you read the, uh, the prophet Jeremiah, uh, the very first chapter, God tasked him with speaking to uh, Israel, which had become pagan uh, in its thinking, uh, and to the nations. Uh, and uh, it's quite amazing because uh, God tells Jeremiah, you know, I've called you from the womb. And by the way, your job description as a prophet is not going to be fun. They are not going to listen to you and it's not going to be pleasant. Uh, he, he stepped into those shoes or sandals, as it were, and said, I'll be that man. Uh, Waldemar Jansen, he's a professor of Old Testament um, at the Canadian Mennonite University in Winnipeg, uh, says this about the prophet Jeremiah. He says, the suffering prophet par excellence is Jeremiah. He's known in uh, Old Testament texts as being the weeping prophet. He wept over his nation. He says, he is called by God against his own protestations. He's mocked persecuted by his fellow villagers of Ananoth, where he was from. Uh, he's forbidden by God to marry and to have children. He was beaten and put into stocks by the priest Pashur. Uh, he barely escapes the death sentence demanded by a mob and must go into hiding for preaching during the reign of King Jehoiakim. He's accused of being a traitor for announcing uh, God's judgment on Jerusalem through the Babylonians. And after being thrown into a dry well to perish, he is eventually rescued and kept in a prison only to be carried off to Egypt against his will. Sounds like a job description you want, right? If God has showed you that job description and said, will you take this? Uh, I think I'll pass. No, God, uh, God said, I'm going to make you uh, a powerful voice to the nation, uh, a tough trying ministry. And so if you do the math, and I went back into his life and studied uh, this week, they estimate that he um, prophesied from 627 BC, and bear in mind the first Babylonian invasion was around 605 BC. Uh, where they carried away uh, young men like um, Daniel. Um, so from 627 BC to 580 BC, thereabouts, he prophesied for some 90 years. Some 90 years. Uh, he is one of my favorite uh, prophets of the Old Testament. Uh, I think I identify with his, um, the emotion, the things that he feels about his nation, the sin that he sees, uh, and what kind of men you're called to be or a woman in a culture that has... Uh, thrown off things that are most dear. And this was him. How did he keep it together uh, in, a, in a place of opposition? How did he keep it together? How did he remain a, a powerful presence each day for 90 years? Imagine. Uh, three things come to mind. Uh, all these things relate to Psalm 119, in case you're wondering where I'm going. I don't meander, correct? I don't know. How did he hold it together? Uh, three things. Number one, uh, he knew God called him. He absolutely knew that. Um, Hobart Freeman uh, used to be an Old Testament scholar at Dallas Theological Seminary. In my estimation, he's written the definitive book on the prophets. If you want to read about prophets, that's the book. Uh, he says this, uh, not only had Israel forsaken the true God, uh, whom she alone had been privileged to know, according to Amos 3, 2, but she had also magnified her sin and shame by exchanging the only true and living God for worthless idols, which are called broken cisterns. You know, a cistern where it's carved out of the limestone, water feeds into it and houses the water for people to draw from, especially in time of war. But if it's, if it's broken, it leaks and there's garbage comes in and it's terrible. He says that's, that's like a false theological system or a false ideological system. Promises you great things, ends up being worthless to you. He said that's what Israel did. He knew God called him to go speak to those people. Number two, uh, he knew that God was with him no matter what, because in verse 8 of chapter 1, God had said to him, do not be afraid of them. He says, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Don't waffle. Don't, don't rattle your bones. Don't worry. No matter what happens, I'm with you. Number three, he was able to keep it going for 90 years because he gained insight, wisdom, and strength from the Word of God. The Word of God empowered him. When he was low, when he felt like it was over, when the opposition was so great, uh, it was the word of God that came to him. And if you do a, a word search uh, on the word of the Lord as it came to Jeremiah, uh, you're going to find a lot of hits. Uh, because now we have the inscripturated word that we can go to to study his life. He was getting the actual word from God, which now becomes the inspired word. Uh, and you can read all, I, I went through and counted all of them where the word of the Lord came to him. Uh, I won't read them all to you. Uh, you can read my notes tomorrow online. It's all through the book like a beautiful thread, which relates to your, your life. When you look at Jeremiah and you look at Psalm 119, which talks about how do you function in a godless, god, in a culture that's just going off the rails, which Israel did, um, 
you're a lot like Jeremiah. The, the Greek word for prophet, uh, prophetes, uh, means two things. It means to foretell the future with precision, not, not abstract, grandiose things, but precision, and then to uh, foretell truth, speak with power. Uh, he was both of those things. I am no prophet because a prophet has the ability to foretell the future with precision. He was a foreteller of the word of God with great power. So we are much like Jeremiah in that we are called forth to bring the word of God to the culture in question to call them back to God. And this, the same three things that kept him going for 90 years uh, should keep you going as well. You are called by God to be the prophet, as it were, to your nation to your family, to your children, to wherever you work. You're called to be the voice of truth to them. Number two, uh, you have God's word that he will be with you no matter what. Hebrews 13, 3, uh, Jesus promised you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he does not lie. Number three, uh, you have access to God's word. So in very tough times and in, in, in times that are uh, create a lot of emotional angst in you, where should you be going for strength? Well, where did this, uh, this, this old saint go? Imagine. I don't think anybody in the room is 90 yet, are you? Or they can't hear me at this point. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> so 90. Can you imagine? Lord, how can I keep it going for 90 years? What, what, how does he basically say? Those three things. God called me. Do you remember? God's with me. And number three, I go to the Word of God. Now, I could say our sermon's over because that's basically Psalm 119. But I still got a few minutes. Trust, trust me. We want to dive into this uh, because you, this, should, this should be your go-to book, right? When you, you are frustrated, when you're, you, you, you don't know what to do, you're being opposed, uh, what should you be doing? Well, you, you should be going to this book. You should be reading and analyzing it and asking God, could you please speak to me? And boy, will he in a profound way. So the main motif of uh, Psalm 119, which, as I said, is a very long chapter, uh, 176 verses, um, is how can, how can you, how can I stand strong and, and, and true in tough times? And we live in very tough times. How can we do that? So by way of review, in case you weren't here last week, uh, the first two points that we've seen through this book are, are this. Number one, uh, the divinely inspired word of God shows you how to stay undefiled in tough times. So no greater thing in a, in a, in a carnal culture than for a Christian to stand on the morality and teachings of the word of God. They will not know what to do with you. Then you will be light, and then you will be salt to the decaying meat. Just abide by, by the word of God. And God shows you in the scriptures how not to be defiled. And so uh, lead a life that's pure. Number two, by way of review, uh, the divinely inspired word gives you precise insight. And we saw that in verses 17, 18, verse 24, etc. It helps you as you study the poetical literature, the uh, proverbial literature, the apocalyptic literature, uh, the narrative literature. When you read and you study, uh, God's going to give you a precise understanding of your situation. Have you had this happen? You're facing a tough situation for your faith, and you're in a quandary about what to do, and you just happen to be reading the scriptures, and all of a sudden, ta-da, God spoke. It's unbelievable. It's, it's amazing when it happens. And so that's what he says. Be, be in the word, and God's going to connect the dots of stories and put you in there and say, that's what you do. Number now, now we're into what we want to talk about. You ready? Number three, how do you stand strong and true? Number three, the word of God rejuvenates you. It rejuvenates you. So I would say that no saint is made of stone. I sure, certainly am not. I am a man. Things get me down. Things get me depressed. I'm more of a, a glasses half full kind of person, but it doesn't mean I can take anything. I mean, things, some things are tough. Um, and so no saint is made of stone. And when you stand up and speak the truth of the word of God um, and face opposition for it, it, it's a draining. And it's one thing to be brave behind this pulpit. It's another thing to be brave when I walk out of here and I go to my job and I'm brave there. That's a whole other thing. You need bravery in both places. But either way, you're going to get drained uh, as, as you are, or are for the word of God. And you will get hits from it as the word, as the world, oppo as the world opposes you. Because remember we said last week, that Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. They're going to hate you. So we want to look at the, he says here that you need to be rejuvenated, rejuvenated. Uh, this is uh, him getting raw and real as he talks about how he feels. He feels like, uh, well, he's been thrown into the dust, like the wind is out of his sails, like he's got not much left. So he uses this word, uh, the Hebrew word is uh, kaya, 
uh, which means uh, to take something and breathe life into it. You ever felt like that? You're so drained from the complexities of your family, of work, and the godless side of your family, and all that, and that you just feel like, what else can I say? What else can I do? You, you're at that point where I just need life breathed back in my body. Uh, that's what he's talking about here. Uh, the word, the Hebrew word speaks of reviving a weary person. Uh, when I looked at the Septuagint, the Septuagint is a Greek version of the Old Testament. It's also called the LXX, representing the, the scholars that uh, translated the Hebrew text into the Greek. Uh, so that the, that the Jews living under the reign of Alexander the Great uh, could understand the Hebrew Bible because now everything was Greek. Uh, the Greek word here, equivalent, uh, is um, it, it's a preposition word which means to rekindle a fire. Uh, and this particular, uh, pureo is the Greek word uh, for fire, and, and they've taken the word, uh, the preposition ana, and they've wedded that to it. And when they do that, as I've told you before, it intensifies the word. So it doesn't just mean uh, make a fire, it means really rekindle this fire, because it's almost out. Again, have you ever felt like that? Your little flame of faith is just about out. And what do you need? God, I need you to like rekindle my flame. When I think about somebody that needs their flame rekindled, I think of Elijah. I mean, think of him. Great saint, took on the prophets of Baal. First, uh, I think it's day two when we go to Israel, we drive up the Carmel mountain range. We go to the, the Carmelite mission where he took on the prophets of Baal. It's overlooking the valley of Armageddon. It's awesome. But after that great victory, after a great victory, he ran for his life from what lady? Jezebel. And boy, did he run all the way down into the Sinai, into the middle of nowhere. He winds up in a cave. Remember the story? He's in the cave feeling sorry for himself. And then 1 Kings 19, God sees him in the cave. God comes to him, tries to get his attention. First, uh, well, there was a strong wind went by the cave. God wasn't in the cave. Then God sent a localized earthquake. Bad thing to be in a cave when there's an earthquake, correct? There's an earthquake, and God went in that, and then he's sitting there going, what's going on? And then all of a sudden, he heard a little breeze kind of blowing through the cave. And he's like, what is that? And he stopped and listened, and it was the voice of God. Have you ever really con contemplated what God asked them? God asked him this, whispering to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> uh, running from Jezebel? What are you doing here? You don't have to stop and think about that this week. Um, has, has God whispered to you lately? Is he whispering to you now? Like saying, what are you doing there? Why aren't you saying something? Why aren't you speaking up? Why are you running from her? Why are you afraid of him? Is God whispering to you? That's, a, that's another side sermon. That's extra stuff, okay? Is God whispering to you? So don't you know that he needed his little life built back up and flame rekindled? I don't know if you've ever stood over a fire. I did it as a young man, fire full of coals and everything at a church picnic or something with a big can of lighter fluid. <laughs> I did this. Who, who has not done this? Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't, don't follow my example. But I remember doing it in high school at a church picnic with the men, sand dunes where I live, it's where we went out in the desert, big fire, uh, and, you know, and... What guy hasn't gone there with a can of lighter fluid? Let me uh, kind of help that along. <laughs> you know, what's really bad about that? It can come back up and blow you up. Yeah, now I'm going to be an example that, uh, you know, I, I let go of the can quickly. But uh, I was thinking about that this week. Is like rekindle, rekindle. Oh, yeah. It's kind of like that. When you're like, your flame's about out because the world has got you down. God says, hey, let me rekindle you. And it's kind of like that, just burning brightly for God. But notice how he feels, the psalmist feels. And I'll just read a couple of excerpts from the passage. He shares all through the passage how he feels. Verse 25, my soul cleaves to the dust. I mean, I'm down in the dirt. He says, uh, Lord, revive me. Revive me according to thy word. Verse 37, turn away my eyes from looking at vanity and revive me in thy ways. Verse 40, behold, I long for thy precepts. Revive me through thy righteousness. Verse 88, revive me according to thy loving kindness, so that I might keep the testimony of thy mouth. Verse 107, I am exceedingly afflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to thy word. 156, great are thy mercies, O Lord. Revive me according to thine ordinances. 107, revive me according to thy word, O Lord. 
verse 154. Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to thy word. What has he done multiple times? He's told you, I am, my little flame is about out. Lord, I need you to revive me. I've been Jeremiah to my culture. It's draining me. I'm down on the dirt. I'm eating dirt. And they're, they're all doing great. But Lord, I, I, need, I need you to put some wind in my cells to switch metaphors. I, I need some help. You ever been there? See, the, if you look at uh, verse 69, he talks about how the lies they spread about him almost got him, just got to him, got to him. And it's those, it's not, it's not that the culture is not about reason and debate. They're about rhetoric, of, about attacking you. And, and so it's ad hominem attacks against you, your personality, your character, etc. Been there, done that, experienced that a lot of times. How do you defend yourself from that? And he says, Lord, uh, when I think about all the lies they told about me, it's just, just it's really, it's about put out my little flame. Uh, verse 85, uh, he talks about how they were constantly thinking of ways to dig pits that he would fall into them. I mean, he's like, pray, and they're coming after him. Uh, he kept it going. How did he keep it going? Well, it says in verse 25, my soul cleaves to the, the dust, revive me according to thy word. He tells you, when he faced hostilities, he went to the word of God. That's what he did. He went to the word of God, and he said, God, I, I, I'm going to read the word of God and it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to revive my flame. It's going to put wind in my cells. It's going to rekindle all that I need to have to move forward. Uh, think about how the Word of God does this. We're going to take a little perusal of the book of Proverbs. And we'll look about how if you go to the book of Proverbs for wisdom and insight in tough times, how it can revive you. I'll give you a case in point. Uh, Proverbs chapter 2. And by the way, Proverbs teaches you, if you read it, there's two paths of life. The path of the wise man and the path of the fool. And you got one choice. Uh, and if you choose the, the path of the wise man, which follows God and his principles, he'll bless you. If you choose the path of the fool, he will curse you and make your life difficult eventually. He'll judge that life. And so Proverbs 2 verse 20 says this. So you will walk into the way of good men, that's the smart path, and keep to the paths of righteous. For the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. Notice the contrast. Uh, but the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous will be uprooted from it. So it seems today as you look at the godless, it's the reverse of that. It seems like they do whatever they want to do un to undo morals and, and moral thinking and righteous ways. And you name, undo, uh, they undo laws. They create laws that are anti-law. And, and, but what does God say? And, and, and what's the wisdom and insight for your little flame? God tells you, don't worry. Don't worry. The great reset's not coming. Now the great reversal's coming. What's the great reversal? Well, when the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Keep your mind on this. Proverbs says, be wise, choose the higher path, and eventually God will bless that path. Uh, Proverbs 3, verse 25. Do not be afraid of sudden fear, nor the onslaught of the wicked when it comes, not if it comes, but when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. He's going to be with you. Remember Jesus? We said it in Hebrews 13, verse 5. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And the Proverbs says, don't be afraid of sudden fear. When, when bad things happen in your life or in your nation, God says, I'm with you in either place. You just be my light, and I'm going to be with you. That's designed to help your flame burn brightly. Proverbs 11, verse 5. The righteousness of, blame, of the blameless will smooth his way, but the wicked will fall by his own wicks, wickedness. This is, like I've told you before, is what goes around comes around. If you want to live, live, live a wicked life, what's it eventually going to catch up with you? That's just how God wired the moral universe. He says, but if you're a righteous person and you live a blameless moral life, uh, God's going to smooth out your way. I mean, and your conscience is going to be cleansed too, so you're not going to have to worry about things. See, you can read the word of God and it can, it can put that lighter fluid on your fire because it gives you wisdom and insight how to function. So you probably need to get off of Facebook and get your face in the book. Okay. <laughs> I had to throw that in because I don't know if you were listening to me. So what did I just say? You might need to get off Facebook and get in the book, the book, read it and say, God, teach me, underscore the lives of what he, uh, people's names and stories and things and say, God, teach me, show me, rekindle my flame. He's the almighty. Uh, I read a poem uh, that I think is most appropriate. I'm going to share it with you. I don't do a lot of poetry. Do I look like a poetry guy? Nah, but this, this one is, is good, so bear with me. I'm not a poetical reader, but I'll give it a shot. We've traveled together through life's rugged way, or 
over land and over water, by night and by day. To travel without it, I would never try. We keep close together, my Bible and I. In sorrow I proved in comfort and joy when weak in my strong tower, which uh, naught can destroy. When death comes so near me, tis thought I would die. We are still together, my Bible and I. If powers of evil are against me would come and threaten to rob me of heaven and home, God's word then directs me to him in the sky. Nothing can part me from my Bible and I. When evil temptations are brought to my view and I in my weakness know not what to do, on Christ as my strength I am taught to reply, and so we keep company, my Bible and I. When life's path is ended, if Jesus should come and take his blood purchase brethren home, oh, if in long suffering he waits till I die, we'll never be parted, my Bible and I. And when in the glory, my Lord, I behold, with all of his redeemed gathered safe in the fold, my Bible and I, close, close companions will be, for God's word abides for all eternity. That's why I like poetry, because poetry speaks, doesn't it? And, and this is the object of the poem. Do you feel the same way? I feel the same way, because in tough times, this is where I go. God, teach me, speak to me, uh, and help me to uh, have that strength that I need to move forward like a Jeremiah. Number two. The Word of God uh, also uh, it doesn't just revive you. It gives you light for living. So I brought you something that I had to buy when I moved to uh, <laughs> Virginia because you don't need these in California because the power never goes out where I lived. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how many times the power has got out on my house. Does your power got out on your house? Little wind, no power. You know, snowstorm, ice storm, no power. You know, we've had to call friends to go live at their house because it's, you know, 10 degrees outside and I can't, we tried to stay in our house one night around the fire in the living room. That doesn't work. And so when I first moved here, we were told, you need these on every level of your home. I was like, whatever for? And then we lost power and you can't see anything. So I went, I bought, have, do you have these? No? Yeah. Well, the Bible's telling you, you need to have one of these. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, um, so I went out and bought a bunch of these, and I'm now like a flashlight lantern freak. I have them everywhere. So if, you, if, if power's out in my neighborhood, I can tell you who's going to have some light. Because uh, <laughs> we have these in the closets. You know, if you're, on the, you know, you're in the basement, you know where to go. If you're on the first floor, you know where to go. If you're on the third floor, you know where to go. Uh, if you're in the car, I got them in the side pockets of the car. They're in my briefcase. <laughs> they're, they're in drawers. They're in the kitchen. They're under the bed. They're everywhere. Light is good, isn't it? So what does he say in Psalm 119.105, which most people have memorized? Thy word is a lamp to what? My feet. Now, I won't do it. Yeah, I, I'm not going to turn out the lights in the sanctuary. Yeah, but if I did, and I just turned this on, you could really see this if I really turned it on, right? So what, what did he just say? Thy word is a what? Lamp unto my feet, which means... The path of life is dark, isn't it? Many twists and turns that you did not anticipate. Uh, like I told a couple coming in here, I, I never planned on being a pastor. I didn't train to be a pastor. I only trained to be a professor. what God do? Threw me a curveball with a special needs child. And the rest is history. God sent me in another direction. So the, the path of life is very dark. And so what do you need? You need the Word of God. This is where I feel sorry for a person who doesn't know God. Because they're walking through life, stumbling all over everything. Because they can't see. But I as a Christian, you as a Christian, can take the Word of God and hold it up in front of your life and go, okay, I'm dating God. Should I marry her? Should I not marry her? Should I even be dating her? Should I be dating him? Et cetera, and et cetera, and et cetera. I mean, you hold up the Word of God. And I've been married 41 years. How, listen, I've made it this far. This, this. I was talking to the utility guy that came to my house yesterday, Miss Utility, uh, and I thought he looked familiar. And I'm like, hey, you look like Stan, who's done all this stuff at work, spray painting everything around here. I'll forgive you. Um, and uh, so I was just talking to Stan in my front yard. He's going to spray some stuff in my front yard. And, and I was like, how's your life going, Stan? He goes, well, you know, my wife and I have been married, you know, like 31 years. And I go, how have you made it 31 years? He goes, we now have God in the center of our relationship. Well, that's like a light. That's what I told him. It's like a light. And so the psalmist says, you want to live uh, well in tough times? You got to have the word of God in your life like a light. It's going to show in front of you which way to walk. Now, the scriptures are very clear of dark living. Now, Galatians 5. Here's what Paul says about dark living. 
of the non-Christian. It says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are, he's going to list them, immorality, which is the Greek word pornea, which covers any kind of sexual sin you could think of, uh, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, which is the Greek word pharmakia, drugs, uh, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, which is, you know, wild partying, uh, and things like these, of which Paul says, I forewarn you, just as I forewarned you that those who practice such things, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But if you know Christ and you have the light of the word in your life, you'll inherit the kingdom. See, it's the light of the believer is to, is to be present to show that non-Christian the value of the light. And you look at verses 71 and 75 uh, in this psalm as you look at how the light is given to us for the road ahead. This is a, one place where he shows you how the word of God gave him light in his affliction. Notice what he says, verse uh, 71. It is good for me that I was afflicted and that I might learn thy statutes. The law of, of thy mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Thy hands They've made me, they fashioned me. Give me understanding that I might learn thy commandments. May those who fear thee see me and be glad because I wait for thy word. Then he says this amazing thing in verse 75. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are righteous and that in faithfulness thou hast afflicted me. This is unbelievable. Think about verse 71. So remember the word of God is light for dark times. So God, I'm being attacked for my faith. Try to be a godly man in a very uh, testy time. But I've learned, I've gained insight from the scriptures. Verse 71 is, he said, I've learned that it is good for me to be afflicted. Who here today would say, oh yeah, amen to that. I didn't hear one amen when I said that. No, you gotta, I gotta think about that, Lord. I mean, when you're in affliction, you're thinking, oh God, deliver me from this. Get me out of this. This is terrible. This, is, this can't be your will. What did he just say? It is good for me to be afflicted. It's good. Why? That I might learn thy statutes. See, when you're afflicted, it drives you to the word. The word tells you how God wants you to behave. You modify your behavior. You glorify God. That echoes in eternity. Can you say, God, it's my affliction that I'm currently going under is good? Uh, I think a, a good prayer this afternoon would be, God, help me to see what I'm enduring is from your good hand because you don't make mistakes. Such as the, are the ways of God. Uh, over my Christian life, I've been through all kinds of things. Uh, and they haven't all been pleasant. Some of them are very difficult. Uh, when my last church split in 1993 and I lost 106 people and it left me with uh, about 75 people, it was emotionally trying when a wealthy man split my church. This is tough. I've been, through, I've been deserted by friends. I thought were my friends. I mean, I've, been, I've seen it all, I think. But through all those afflictions, uh, I've seen that God, as Paul says in, in Ephesians, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you ask or think. Uh, you just stay obedient to him. And you have to get to the point where you say, God, my affliction that I'm experiencing is it is good because it's helping conform me to your image. And it helps to burn out the dross and the things that don't need to be there. Verse 75 is equally instructing where he says, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are righteous and that in faithfulness, Thou hast afflicted me. I don't know how you feel about prepositional phrases. I love them. Because that one is most instructive. In faithfulness. That's, that's the prepositional phrase. In faithfulness, thou hast afflicted me. What does that mean? Whatever God permits in your life as you stand for him, well, he, his hand is always behind all of that. He's never wrong. He's never capricious. He never does half-baked things in your life. He's never thoughtless. He never is purposeless. He's never arbitrary. No, he always looks down at your life and says to you, you need that right now. That's going to conform you to my image. The Roman governor Felix left Paul languishing in prison for two years because he wanted to grant the Jews a favor, according to Acts 24, 27. Joseph, in the Old Testament, suffered in prison for two years simply because the cupbearer forgot about him. But God didn't forget about him. See, God set up those terrible situations to use those two men in greater ways, such as you, such as you. See, their oppressors back then were really working in behalf of the possessor, God. Let's make that personal. Your oppressors are really working in behalf of the sovereign God who is your possessor. Do you think he will forget about you? I think not. He says, in faithfulness, thou hast afflicted me. Uh, I would pray for the wisdom to embrace that. That God, no matter what you bring my way, as I stand for you, as I try to live for you, 
might I see through the affliction that it's shaping me, shaping me into your image, conforming me, uh, and putting me in a position where I can be used in a greater fashion. What does the word of God do? What does affliction do? As you read about it, it drives you to lay hold of the lamp to say, God, I need this little lamp in my life. Show me what I should do. Um, you probably spend more time checking your Instagram than you do reading this, if truth be known. No, the person in affliction say, God, I'm not going to check my Instagram account constantly. I'm going to check your account to see what I need to know in my affliction. Uh, don't worry, I'm not against Instagram. Uh, 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 affliction causes you to see, as Paul learned in 2 Corinthians 12, that God's grace is sufficient when you're weak. God whittles down even the greatest men and women to make them weak so they can lean on him and see his great strength. Uh, affliction uh, prunes you so you can produce. Uh, Joseph Hall once stated, the most generous vine, if not prune, runs out into many superfluous stems and grows at least weak and fruitless. So doth the best man, if he be not cut short in his desires and pruned with affliction. And I, as a landscaper, totally understand this. Sometimes you've got to make radical cuts to get optimum productivity. When you look at your life and say, God, why in the world have you brought the affliction? God says, oh, it will produce awesome things for eternity. And then lastly, um, uh, the affliction that you find in your life that's related to God's sovereign work in your life uh, gives you a new paradigm. Uh, S.I. Prime said years ago, if your cup seems too bitter, if your burden seems too heavy, be sure that it is the wounded hand that is holding the cup and that it is he who carries the cross that is carrying the burden. That's a new way to look at things, is it not? That God, as I, as I take my lantern and I look at my life and what I'm experiencing and I turn it on, the first thing I see is there's a nail scarred hand with me. That's my Lord, that's my Savior who said, I shall never, what? I shall never leave you nor forsake you. You're not alone. You're never going to be alone. I'm always going to be there to empower you, to encourage you, to put wind in your sails, to rekindle your little flame. And it's all found by reading the book, right? And saying, God, this is my Bible and an I, and I'm going to stay close to it because to stay close to it is to stay close to you and to become wise. What does our world need? But wise men and women, young people, to show forth the love of Christ in truth. Let's pray. God, thank you for the power of the word of God. Uh, can't get enough of it. It's like a fine meal that you sit down and partake of. And always when I open, uh, you speak. And sometimes in the most shocking fashion, and I'm sure others can identify with the power of the word of God, the voice of the spirit. May we feed on the scriptures, drink the milk of the word, the easy things, eat the meat of the word, the more deep doctrinal things. And through those, understand, like the psalmist did, how to stand uh, boldly and courageously in tough times so that we can be a light to our nation and to our families. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful uh, Labor Day weekend. And uh, I will see you when I see you.